Good day, I'm Griselda von Weyck and today I will be doing the central nervous system. So have you ever wondered why you even need a nervous system? Well, let me tell you why. Just imagine you are walking barefoot, you are strutting your stuff, you are walking, minding your own business, and all of a sudden you step on a piece of glass, right? Now, if you didn't have a nervous system, you would not feel the pain. Yes, yes, I know that you won't be able to walk also, but just bear with me with this example. Okay, so now you're walking, you're walking, you don't know of anything, and this piece of glass is coming deeper and deeper into your tissues, right? Making damage everywhere it goes. And also you are bleeding. You, are, you can bleed to death within an hour, right? And there's bacteria going in there and it's, it's a horrible rotten situation. And you don't know, you're just walking around. So the afternoon when you go and sit down, you want to put on your shoes and you look at this foot, which by the way, you won't be able to do because you won't have eyes, because you don't have a nervous system. You won't be able to hear the screams of the innocent bystanders having to see this mess on your foot. So can you see what the nervous system does for you? It actually protects you against the changes in the environment. There's a lot of stimuli in our environment. Yes, not all of them are harmful, but some are, and this protects our body. It's a very fast and quick response to a stimuli. So what type of stimuli do we get? Now, if you look at these pictures, the first one there is a globe, an old timer's globe, you know, way back. And what does a globe do? It gives us light, right? So it go, that light goes to your eye, and at the back of your eye, you've got photoreceptors. So it stimulates those photoreceptors, it sends an impulse to your brain, and you can see the whole thing in the whole room, the whole image, right? So that's a type of stimuli. But us old timers also know that those blow globes, when we were small, were very attractive. It was like a magnet. We all just wanted to touch it, right? So there was a lot of houses with little children's skin on the globes, burnt onto it. Because the moment you touch it, what happens to your nervous system? There's receptors within this finger, and it sends an impulse through your arm to your brain telling you, ouch! So now you start screaming and taking your oh, hand away and ouch, mommy, and mommy comes around. So that is a pain receptor. So it's pain stimuli, right? The next one we have is you see this little man with a bomb. Look at those eyes. So firstly, it is a light stimuli. He's seeing it, right? It's going to the brain, yeah? What's his brain doing? It's interpreting this information. What's the brain now doing? It's sending an impulse down to the legs. Run, run for your life. Scream, wave your arms, you know, just get away, right? So that is one way of protecting your body as well. Now the next one, as you can see, we all know this one, a little boy. He fell and he scraped his knee and the skin is gone. So that is a pain stimuli. Again, now you're screaming, mommy comes, what does she do? She cleans the wound, stop the bleeding, and you will live. You will live through the day. Right. Another stimuli is like fire, right? I think the cavemen even figured out that you don't put your hand into the fire. Yes, it's very nice, it's warm and comfortable, you know, it's nice sitting next to the fire, but don't put your hand in there. So when you put your hand in there, what happens? The pain or the heat stimuli uh, receptors in your fingers or your hand send all these impulses through the arm to the brain saying, ouch, take out, never do this again. And then you have a wound, all right, because you're stupid. All right, so those are types of stimuli. There are many um, others, you know, hearing and taste, smell, um, seeing, feeling. Um, those are the five senses, right. So. What we are going to do is we're going to look at the human nervous system, right? And we started now with the reasons for the nervous system. It's to protect your body, right, against um, changes in the environment. We're going to look at the central nervous system. We're going to look at the peripheral and autonomic nervous system. We're going to see what nerve cells look like, the reflex arc, illnesses, the eye, and the ear. But we're not going to do all of it Today, um, we will break it up in sessions. Let's move on. So, let's start with the key concepts that you need 
for the human nervous system. The first part is the word impulse. Such an important word. A signal um, that's transmitted along the nerve cell. People never use the word message, ever. This is not a WhatsApp. This is not your Instagram DM. You cannot talk about messages here. No messages. It's only impulses. Right, it's an electrical impulse. Right, neuron. That is a specialized cell, right? And you've learned about this in grade 10, that transmits impulses in the nervous system. So they basically um, let the impulse run along them and they transmit them. The next one is a stimulus. I, I spoke about that. It's a detectable change like pain, heat, light, sound that will be received by a, a important word, the receptor, your eye, your ear, your skin. Right, receptor, like I said, that's the structures located in the sense organs and they convert, this is an important sentence, convert the stimulus into an impulse. This is very important. Okay, next, um, the effector, those are the muscles or the glands that respond to the message from the nervous system. So the nervous system will send this impulse to them to uh, make an effect or a change. Right, and then we look at this part here. How does it actually work? Say, for example, you have a spider on your leg. So the first thing is it's crawling up there. It's a stimulus. So your skin will send, the, in, um, the receptor in the skin will send that impulse via the sensory neuron from the senses to the central nervous system, your brain. And then that will interpret it and send it to the motor neuron. The motor neuron will then send an impulse to the effector, which is now the muscle, and that will be your leg muscle. And your leg muscle will start shaking and kicking because you want to get rid of that spider. Okay, so that is basically your response, and that is how the nervous system works. We are going to an ad break now. See you after the break. Welcome back guys from the ad break. Now let's see what we are going to do now. So like I said, we did the reasons for the nervous system, right? Why do you have one? And now we're going to move to the central nervous system. Now our key words here is central nervous system and that consists of the brain and the spinal cord, right? So it's easy to remember, it's only two parts um, that forms part of the central nervous system. And I always tell the children, it's central nervous system, it's in the center of your body, brain and um, spinal cord, right? In the center, Mr. Fenter. Just remember it like that, central. The brain, well, I do hope you know what a brain is. That's the thing here in your head, right? That's the reason why you have a cell phone, why you have internet, why we are living in houses, driving cars. It's because of all this abstract thought, right? It's intelligence. This is where intelligence is seated, right? And also, it will interpret senses, right? What is the five senses again? It is smelling, it is tasting, it is hearing, it is seeing, it is Feeling, right. So all those information coming from the senses goes to the brain, it interprets it and it reacts on it. Okay, so that is what the brain's function is, very important function. The spinal cord is a long, thin, tubular structure within the vertebral column. Now the vertebral column, we did that in grade 10, and that is part of your, your skeletal structure and it's made up of nervous tissue, right? So there's a lot of nervous tissue within the spinal cord. So if you look at this um, flow diagram, you will see the central nervous system is composed of the brain, like that definition said, and the spinal cord. Now we're going to start off 
with the spinal cord. But before we do, we need to know these vital scientific words. The first one is dorsal. Dorsal means the back part or the top part of an animal. What do we mean by that? We mean this is your back, right, here at the back. And if an animal, animals are on fours. So this will be the top part, isn't it? So that will be the dorsal part, all right? And then the ventral part will be the abdominal or lower side. So your tummy or an animal, if you're standing like that, the bottom part. Right, that's ventral. Then afferent, that is conducting inwards towards the central nervous system, towards it. And efferent is conducting outwards. So it's away from the central nervous system. Right, the spinal cord, it connects the brain with the rest of the nervous system. So you'll see, if you look at this picture of the brain, you'll see the spinal cord is here at the bottom, right? And that means that the brain, with all its functions, will be connected to the rest of the body that is down there. All right. The spinal cord is made up of delicate nervous system, which cannot repair itself. The reason being the following. Nerve cells is one of the cells in your body that cannot undergo mitosis. Right? Not at all. And if you remember from the beginning of the year when we looked at mitosis and meiosis, mitosis is the renewal of a cell. It makes a copy of it, it repairs itself, like your skin cells, every day you've got new, basically new skin because of the, the mitosis taking place. Right. Now, nerve cells cannot do that. They cannot repair themselves at all. So when they are bruised, when they are damaged at all, just a little bit, it's gone. They are broken. Right. So that is why spinal cord injuries are so devastating to people. Because the spinal cord can't even be broken. It can just be damaged or bruised and you won't be able to walk or use your arms or your bladder won't work, your lungs won't work. It depends on where the damage was um, taking place. Yes, you can break your back and like break the bony part of the back. If the spinal cord stays intact and unbruised, you will still be able to walk and you'll have full functions. You'll just have broken bones in your back. But if you have spinal cord injury, that's a total different thing. It can take up to 18 months for the spinal cord for that bruising to go down. And after that 18 months, some people regain some of their functions. They can maybe move their arm or move their leg, um, but usually not. Right. So it's really a serious injury when your spinal cord is affected. All right. And um, what they are doing currently is research on stem cells. And I know in Japan, they actually approved the stem cell thera therapy. What they do is they take um, stem cells from bone marrow. Now, if you remember in grade 10, every single bone in your body, in the middle, there is marrow. And within that marrow, there are cells, stem cells. Now, what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that can differentiate or go in and become any type of tissue any type of tissue. So they inject that stem cell into the spinal cord and what they found was it sometimes helped repair the bruising but in a few cases actually new nerve cells started to grow. Right, so there is some hope for people that are affected by this but it's still in research phase and um, you know so there's no cure when your spinal cord is broken. Right, next. Now let's look at our spinal cord. As you can see, important part here, your brain, right? And now we have our spinal cord going down here. And you can see it's surrounded by these bony things here, right? And those bony things you learned in grade 10 are the vertebra. The vertebra, they are bony, they are there for protection. And in between these bony things, there are intervertebral discs, like little cushions, right? And then this is actually protecting the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is 
in there, in the middle there. And the cerebrospinal fluid, this blue stuff here, it's a fluid that acts as a shock absorber as well. So this spinal cord is actually suspended in that fluid, which helps with um, shock absorption. Now, like I said, the spinal cord is situated within the vertebral column, and there are 33 vertebra or bones within the disc, with disc of cartilage between them. Let me tell you about these discs. They are basically little cushions, Within, here's a bone, here's a bone, and there's a little cushion, right. If it wasn't there, you would be walking or you would be running and these bones would be flapping like this, right. What a noise. And the mechanical injury, the friction, can you imagine dwa, 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 walking like that? Your poor, poor spinal cord, right. So we need those discs to be like a shock absorber for these bones, right? So it's protecting that spinal cord within, right? And you've heard of old people or maybe sport peop sporting people that tell, talks about a slipped disc. That is when that disc is slipping out and apparently extremely painful. I don't want that ever in my life because now your nerves are now starting to be irritated. So you've got a lot of pain, right? And we are talking about the protection now, yeah? So the spinal cord is protected by the bones, right? That's the first one, bones, the vertebra. And then three meninges. Now meninges, it sounds very weird, you know, it's a funny name. But meninges is a scientific word for membranes, right? So it's easy, meninges, membranes, right? Just remember it like that. In the old days, you had to remember the names of the three, but luckily you don't have to. So I didn't even put it on the slides because I don't want you to worry about it, okay? You don't need to know the names. All you need to know that there are three membranes. And then cerebrospinal fluid, that is the fluid that you saw on the diagram, which is uh, the spinal cord is suspended in, right? It's like a shock absorber. So there's three ways in which the um, spinal cord will be protected. Firstly, it's within the bony vertebral column. Secondly, the meninges surrounding this and make, uh, making sure that it doesn't go around like this. And then the cerebrospinal fluid, which is also a shock absorber. Right, so those are the three ways in which it is protected. So let's look at the spinal cord from this angle. Right, you can see here, that there is things coming out of the spinal cord, like yeah, and there, we call those roots, right? And the ones with the bubbles in it is dorsal roots because those bubbles are ganglion. We call it ganglion, right? And in your dorsal root, you will always find your sensory neuron. If you look at the bottom here, at this one, they, they actually have it at a different angle, you will see that the, the the front of the, uh, this root is the ventral root, the ventral root, and within the ventral root you will always find the motor neuron that goes away from the spinal cord. And at the back of this motor neuron you'll find the sensory um, root, and that is a sensory neuron that's in the dorsal root. Right, so that's basically, and they just showed you that they cut away some of the membranes, this is the um, outer membrane here. Right, and you can see it, they call it the dura mater, but you don't need to know that. Let's move on. This is an actual picture, what a neurosurgeon um, will see. You can see those little fibers there, those are the roots there. If he cuts it the wrong one there or damages, the person won't be able to walk or talk or whatever. Right, so it's very delicate operations. But this is what you will have. You will see this in your exam paper. So let's look at a transversal view. So let me just show you what a transversal view is. This is your spinal cord and you will cut it transversally like this, right? And then you will look at it from above like that. That is a transversal view. Right, so let's look at our spinal cord. Firstly, the first thing that you will notice is that it is white on the outside and there's a gray area here. It looks like an H. Right, the gray matter is the uh, cell bodies of the neurons that has nucleuses and cytoplasm, and that give it, gives it its grayish color. 
and the neuron fibers, which is more white, will be on the outside, right? So you've got white matter on the outside and gray matter in the inside. There's also a central canal, which contains cerebrospinal fluid, also for protection. And then you have these things here, the spinal nerve, and like I said, the roots, right? These are, these are the roots. And like I told you, the ones with the bubbles, where the dorsal ganglion is, is where your um, sensory neuron is. And the ones without the bubble will be your motor neuron, and that will be your ventral root. So this is the ventral root, and this is the dorsal root. Just see where the bubble or the ganglion is. All right. And um, they are always paired. So for example, let me show you. If your sensory neuron is from your finger, it goes to the spinal cord, the motor neuron will go back to the finger. It will not go back to the eye. So you can't do this and then your eye goes like that. That would be very weird, right? It's paired, it's from the finger back to the finger. All right, that's very important. Then, the spinal cord is the pathway for all impulses conducted, like I said, from the receptors to the brain and from the brain to the effectors, right, to effect that change. Gray matter is in the inside and white matter is on the outside. Right, um, like I said, the paired spinal nerves protrude through the spaces between the vertebra which means between those bones that we were talking about, the spinal nerves will go out there. It's not on the bones, it's in between, right? And all reflex actions will go through this, but we're gonna do more detail on that later. Let's get to some questions. Name the structure depicted in the diagram. Now, if you look at that, that is definitely not the brain, that is the spinal cord, right? Question two, give the letter and the name, so you must give both of the structure that transmits impulses from the receptor towards the structure, so towards the, the spinal cord, right? So we know that the sensory neurons will transmit an impulse from the receptor to the um, uh, spinal cord. I'm getting the name now. So that's not the only answer. They want you to identify it on the picture as well. So where will the Sensory neuron B, if you, I told you, you look where the bubble is, the ganglion is. So this is your dorsal root, and your sensory neuron will always be in your dorsal root. So it will be number A, sensory neuron. Can you see you've got two marks there? Right, identify and write the following name for the following labels. Right, number B, let's look at number B. There is number B, that's the gray part. So that would be the gray matter. C, that is the white part, so it will be the white matter. D, remember now I said that this will be the dorsal root, so what will this be? This will be the ventral root. F, um, that will be the bubble there, and we know that the bubble's name is not a bubble, you do not write bubble, you write dorsal root ganglion. Never bubble, you will not get a mark for the bubble. Let's move on. Name the structure E. Where is structure E? Structure E is right there in the middle there. And that's the central canal. And what is the name of the fluid that's found inside the structure? Remember, that is the cerebrospinal fluid. Name three ways in which the spinal cord is protected against mechanical in injury. Remember, I said the bones, the vertebral column the meninges, the membranes, and it's surrounded by the cerebrospinal fluid. Welcome back. We are going to do the brain now. That's our next section. So you will see we've done this and we're still busy with the central nervous system. Okay, and we have done the spinal cord now. You know what the spinal cord looks like. Now we're going to go into more detail on the brain. 
Remember, we are busy with the central nervous system. Like I said, in the center, Mr. Fenter, the brain and the spinal cord. Right, so that's the two parts of, of the central nervous system. This part here, this grayish liney things here, we call the peripheral nervous system. So it's easy to explain. The central nervous system, periphery. It's to the sides, it's to your arms, it's to your legs, it's to all the organs there. Those are the nerves there. We will do that in a, at a later stage. But today we are concentrating on the central nervous system. Right, this is a view of the brain on the outside, the external view, if you could take somebody's brain. Now usually it will be grayish, but this is a dead brain, so it becomes white after a while. The reason why the brain is gray on the outside is that the nerve cells, cell bodies, has nuclei and cytoplasm, which is grayish. So you'll have a grayish tinge on the outside of the brain. If you cut open the brain, you'll see it's white on the inside because that's the nerve part, um, the, the fiber part of the nerve cells, which is more white in color, right? And you will maybe think, why is the brain like um, folded? If you look at this, look at all these folds here. Right? That is, that is because, um, that is because, okay, sorry, can I start again? What happened now? Okay. Yeah, I'll just say, okay, I'll go on. Yeah. Bing. So if you, okay. If you look at the brain, you'll see it's got a lot of folds here, right? That folds is to increase the surface area because you've got billions and trillions of nervous cells there. If it was just straight, you would have been walking around with a huge head, right? Because the brain will not be able to fit into your skull, right? And you'll see the brain is composed of this big part here. And then there's this small round little thingy here. And then there at the bottom, there's a sticky out thing but we'll go into the detail just now. This is the internal structure of the brain. If you look, this is now they cut it and you can see on the inside. Now you'll see there is a big part, the folded part, that will be your cerebrum and we'll talk about that in more detail later. That's the biggest part where your thinking goes. This white part here is the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum, then you have the um, hypothalamus here, right? Hypothalamus, and you've got your pituitary gland hanging here. And this little thingy here, but it's actually the second biggest part of the brain, is called the cerebellum. And you can see it looks like a little tree. There you can see it is, it looks like branches of a tree. We call that the tree of life, but you don't need to know it, but next time you buy a trinket with the tree of life, you know where, where it comes from. All right, and there's the brain, the pons of Rowley, and here's the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord. But let's have a look at the way in which you will see it in your exam papers and so on. Maybe not in so much color though, but firstly, when we look at this picture, you'll see the big beige part, like I said, the folded part, that's the cerebrum, right? Now, um, the corpus callosum was that white part there that you can see now, it's drawn nicely. There's the hypothalamus, right? And this part here, sorry, I've drawn the wrong place there. There's your pituitary gland, there's a little pea-sized gland hanging down there. Pons of Aroli, yeah. You do not need to know the Pons of Aroli, I'm just telling you that that bump you need, to look for the, you need to look for the bump there, because just below that bump, you find the medulla oblongata, and then the spinal cord will be below the medulla oblongata. And then this yellow thing here with the tree of life there is the cerebellum. Now, one very important thing that you need to remember is that the cerebrum and the cerebellum, it sounds sort of the same but it's not the same. And at the marking venue, we do not accept any spelling errors as so far the cerebrum 
and the cerebellum goes. We don't. Because some children, I don't know whether they get confused or they want to try and trick us. They don't, they're not sure which one it is. Then they will say cerebrum or something like that. They will switch around the L's and the R's. No, we do not accept it. If it's any spelling mistake in those two words, we don't mark it. So make sure that you know the spelling of those two words. Right, so let's go into more detail of each part. Firstly, how is the brain protected? Well, the brain is in your head here, in the skull. This is your skull, right? But within this skull, there's a hollow, a bony hollow. And we call that the cranium. It's very important that you know this term because it links back to human evolution. You're going to do human evolution a little bit later. And you need to know what the cranium is. That's the place where the brain is situated in. Right? The next part is the meninges. Now you know this word already from the spinal cord. That's those three membranes. There's three of them. It's wrapped around the brain. It's wrapped around this brain here, right? And it keeps it in place. And the bony, you can see here the bony cranium. Here's the bony cranium. And can you see that the brain is not filling it up totally? Right. Because if the brain was up to here and a small bump, then you know, you, your brain will be damaged. So the bony casing is there to protect against uh, mechanical injury, as well as the membranes around this brain. And the next thing that is um, also protecting the brain is the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid. Now let's just look at this now. So you've got your brain, and there are three membranes wrapped around this brain. And in between the brain and the membranes, you've got your cerebrospinal fluid. So the, the brain is basically floating in this fluid. And it's also surrounded with the fluid um, between the membranes and the bony casing. So that when you walk around, you know, your brain is, and you bump your head, it is not just damage there. Like it's shock absorption and it's kept in place. Right. Imagine if you didn't have a skull and your brain was flopping around like this above your head. So many people would have died quickly because the first bump, you're dead. Right. So we need this protection, the three protections. First, the bone, the cranium. Secondly, the three membranes. And thirdly, the cerebrospinal fluid. Let's move on. The cerebrum. Like I said, spelling, spelling. Look at the spelling. Now, the cerebrum is this big part here of the brain. And it's always gray on the outside and white on the inside, opposite of the spinal cord. It's the largest part of the brain, and it controls voluntary actions. What do we mean by voluntary actions? I decide I want to go there. I decide I want to write something. I want to eat cake. I want to go and shop. Your brain goes, it tells your legs, go walk, walk, walk to the shop. You get what I'm saying? That's voluntary. So your cerebrum control, controls your voluntary movements. It also higher thought processes. Remember, that's the reason why we are living in houses, having cars, technologies there, because we have the ability for abstract thought, higher thinking, you know, making decisions, judging, stuff like that. It receives in, and interprets impulses from the sense organs. Remember, five organs, uh, sense organs, your eye, your um, taste buds, your nose, smelling, uh, your ear for hearing, and your skin. So all this information goes to your brain, it interprets it, and you react accordingly. Next, the hypothalamus. Now this one is the one that you can blame for a lot of things in your life. We know that teenage boys are very hungry always. Right, first break already, you've eaten all the bread of yours, your friends, everybody you see, you, you've, you're hungry. Now the reason why you're so hungry, it's a hypothalamus, because it controls the hunger. Secondly, thirst is controlled by a hypothalamus. Thirdly, sleep. Remember when you ate all that food in your mom's house, now you're sleepy. It's the hypothalamus fault. Body temperature, you know now with 
um, all the situations in the country that we have a regular checks on our body temperature. It should be around 37, maybe 30, um, 36.8 around there. It's constant body temperature, which is controlled by the hypothalamus. And emotions. If you feel sad, it's not your heart that is sore. It's your hypothalamus' fault. All right. Let's move on. The pituitary gland, that little pea-sized thingy hanging there. Now, that is a master gland, and we will do that in much detail when we do the endocrine system. So today, I'm not going to talk about the pituitary gland in detail. Just know where it is located at. Right, the next part that we're going to look at is the medulla oblongata. It transfers the nerves impulses between the brain and the spinal cord. So there's the brain and the spinal cord here at the bottom, right? And, um, sorry, I have to start over. Something's gone wrong, yeah. What's wrong now? Get a pen. Get a pen. Get a pen. Oh. All right, let's just see. Okay. Well, let me just take that out. It's not, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so now we're going to look at the medulla oblongata. That transfers the nerves, impulses between the brain and the spinal cord. Now, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to see that because the medulla oblongata is located in between the brain and the spinal cord. Right, so it transfers the, the signals, or not the signals, the impulses um, through to the spinal cord. Now the medulla oblongata is a very important part of our brain and it controls our heartbeat, our breathing, peristalsis. Now if you remember from grade 11, when you eat, there's peristalsis taking place in your digestive system. So when you eat that pizza, it goes down the gullet, and now it sits here. You can't tell yourself, okay, now it must go down, go down. You can't. Peristalsis is when the muscles start to contract, pushing that food bolus down, and this one is relaxing, and then this one is contracting, and the next one is relaxing, so that the food can be pushed down. That is peristalsis. Now, the medulla oblongata also um, will control your peristalsis, Swallowing, to actually swallow that pizza, you need your medulla oblongata. Reflexes like coughing, now you ate the pizza and the pizza has now went down the wrong hole, it's into your lungs. Now the medulla oblongata is telling your breathing um, muscles, please contract and relax so you can cough and get that pizza out of your lungs so you can live. Or blinking, that's when that mosquito goes for your eye and you just blink in time so that the, the attack is um, ward off. Sneezing is when the mosquito goes up in your nose and you sneeze it out. So the medulla oblongata is really looking after you. Thermoregulation we will be doing after homeostasis. That's the way your skin will cool you down or warm you up. But we're not going to look at that now. All right. So... Um, the medulla oblongata down here is very important. If that is damaged, you are basically brain dead because your heart won't beat, you won't breathe, all these things won't happen. Next, the cerebellum. Right now, look at the double L there, the cerebellum. Second largest part of the brain coordinates the skeletal muscles. What that means is the following. As you are walking, the one leg goes in front of the other one. You don't try to get both legs in front, eh? you'll fall down. Right, that's the, where the uh, coordination comes in. Maintains balance so that you don't fall over like this. Right, maintains balance. Then it maintains muscle tone. Your muscles are supple. They can move. People that are damaged or their cere cerebellum is damaged, um, their muscles become very taut and they need physiotherapy to, to keep their muscles more supple and make movement possible. The next one is the corpus callosum, like I said. That one connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So you have a right and a left hemisphere of your brain, right? They need to communicate with each other because the left hand is abstract, you know, doing math. The right hand is very creative, doing paintings. So they have to communicate with each other. The one can't go off 
painting and the other one doing math. Right, they must do it together. They must go together, think together. Another interesting fact is that your right hand hemisphere controls your left side of your body and your left hand hemisphere um, controls the right side of your body. And the nerves cross over at your medulla oblongata. Right. Okay, guys, we're going to go for an ad break now. Um, get some tea or coffee, some cookies, and then you come back afterwards. Thank you. See you just now. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your cookies, your tea, your coffee, maybe some cool drink and you're well rested and you can, we can continue now with the central nervous system. So what we have left now is some questions on the brain. So the first question here is identify part A. Now remember what I told you. When you have a situation like this, right, always look at the top part as being the medulla oblongata and the bottom one will always be the spinal cord, always. Right, so in this case they want to know what A is, so that would be the spinal cord. I'm just trying to switch over this. I don't know why it switched over. <coughs> God, what have I done? <coughs> she broke it. Jackie. I broke it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, it just disappeared. Okay. So where did up until the where can we go? Spinal cord, the first one. Yeah. Okay. B. All right. Yeah. Yes. The next one they ask is C. So let's look where C is. C is showing just below the big part of the brain. Remember, the big part of the brain is the cerebrum. It's just below it because it's not folded. There's no folds there. Right, there's no folds there. So that can only be the corpus callosum. Right, the corpus callosum. Next question. Write down the letter and the name of the part. Now, people, we had this question in the past and children would just write down the letter. Please read your questions very carefully. They want both there. If you only write the letter or you only write the name, you only get one mark out of two. And that is a waste of marks. We don't want that. So, has the center for inter interpreting taste? Now remember, the, the big part of our brain, the cerebrum, is the part where all the senses, the information from the sensor, sense organs comes in and are interpreted. So that would definitely be number D, the cerebrum. And again, look at the spelling here. Do not confuse this with the cerebellum. Do not make any errors here. Don't say cerebellum. I don't know. I'm telling you, I've seen some answers in the past. I don't know. It must be the correct spelling. Regulates the heart rate. Remember I said this is a very important part of your brain. If this is damaged, then you know you're dead. Or well, you won't know, but you will be dead. And that is our medulla oblongata, just below that little bulge there, right? And that will be number B. So one mark there, one mark there for the letter and the name. Don't forget to write both. Is responsible for the motor coordination. Now remember, motor coordination is your muscles working nicely, being coordinated. And that is your cerebellum. Cerebellum there, number E. 
Right, let's go there. So a mark for E and a mark for cerebellum. Once again, don't make funny stuff here. Don't sell a brim or something there. No, it's cerebellum. Know the spelling. Right, write down the name and letter of the, um, of the part. So it's the same question. We're just continuing now. D maintains balance. Again, this would be your cerebellum. That part there, the small brain there. And watch your spelling there. Memorize a number. How do we memorize a number? We use higher thought functions. Where are our higher thought functions situated? It's situated in the cerebrum. Oh, I almost said cerebellum. D, one mark, and cerebrum, your second mark. Right, so please, I'm overemphasizing this, but I'm seeing this every single year. Watch the spelling. Don't lose marks unnecessary. Connects the brain to the rest of the body. Right, that's an easy one. There's the brain, and there's the spinal cord. So that's the only one that's not, you know, it's not part of the brain. It's connecting the rest of the body with the brain. So it's the spinal cord, and it's number A. 1.3. What are the membranes surrounding the brain cord? Oh, this is so easy. Come on, people. This will, can only be the thing that sounds like a membrane, the meninges. The meninges. Remember that. It's an easy mark. Name the three structures that protects the brain. Okay, well, obviously this is going to be one of them, isn't it? Always start with the bony part. What is the bony part? It's the cranium. Then we go to our membranes, the meninges, and then we go to our fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid. So those three. And it's the same with the spinal cord, except here they have the vertebral column. Question two. Name the two parts of the central nervous system. In the center, Mr. Fenter, remember, brain and spinal cord. Right, two marks there. Which part of the brain controls body temperature? Can you remember what I said there? It's the same part that's doing the hunger and the thirst. It's a hypothalamus. And I almost gave you the answer for the other one as well. Controls breathing. Oh, this is a very important part of your brain. Remember, if you, this is damaged, you're dead. It's the medulla oblongata. Question 2.3. Why does damage to the medulla oblongata lead to instant death? Right, so you have to give us the function of the medulla oblongata, but then you must also say what happens when there's damage. So that will be the second part of your answer. So let's look at the answer. Firstly, it's responsible for controlling the breathing rate, so that's your function. And then this person will not be able to breathe. That's what the damage causes. So that's where your second mark comes. Some children stopped here because they feel, Ish, you know, it's, I don't feel like it, I'm so over it. But you have to tell, tell us what happens if it's damaged. Or you could have spoken about the heart rate, the heartbeat. It's responsible for controlling the heart rate so that the heart will stop beating. So this is the part where the damage is done, this part here. Right. And that's how you answer this question. Thanks for joining me today. We're now at the end of our session. I hope you enjoyed it and that you know more about the brain and the spinal cord. See you next time. Wolves and Metrics 2021 Catch-Up is brought to you by the Department of Basic Education, NECT, ETDP CETA, SABC, Multi-Choice and DBE TV on OpenView Channel 122 in partnership with...